Thank you. Uh, Representative Hansen, do you wanna go next and introduce yourself? Thank you, my name is Rick Hansen. Um, I'm coming to you live from uh, Black Sheep Coffee Shop in South St. Paul. So uh, you may hear the grinders in the background, but uh, <laughs> uh, pleased to be here this morning. And I've, I've uh, served in the Minnesota House uh, since being elected in 2004. Currently, I uh, uh, grew up on a farm in Southern Minnesota in Freeborn County. Uh, my mother uh, grew up on a farm in Fillmore County and I own land uh, there now in both counties uh, and implement conservation practices on the, that property. Uh, I represent South St. Paul, West St. Paul, Mendota Heights, Mendota and Lilydale, and uh, serve on uh, not only environment, but the Legislative Audit Commission and uh, the LCCMR. So I am pleased to be here today and look forward to the questions. Thank you, uh, Representative Long. Good morning, everyone. Great to be with you all this morning. I'm Jamie Long. I am in my second term representing uh, Southwest Minneapolis in the House. And I am honored to be the chair of the Climate and Energy Committee uh, in the House. Um, climate and energy policy has been a real passion of mine for for some time uh, before I was in the legislature, I worked as an energy um, aide in Congress and practiced law in the environmental energy space before that. Uh, so it's been a real, real privilege to get to work on these issues in the House and to get to partner with uh, Senator Sengem on these issues. So um, glad to be with everybody today. Wonderful. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate uh, our lawmakers and everybody joining us this morning. Um, and I would again jump into and uh, encourage you to send questions uh, to Rachel during this conversation. We'll get to some of those at the end. Uh, but before we get into some of the specific, uh, you know, energy and climate policy, let's talk just kind of big picture about session. Uh, session begins next week and lawmakers are heading into this year with a $7.7 .7 billion surplus. New legislative maps are being drawn. It's an election year. Uh, we're still facing hurdle, hurdles around COVID-19. Uh, there's just so much happening. So I'm wondering if our lawmakers can talk just a little bit about what this session is going to look like for Minnesotans and what some of the priorities are for your caucus. So uh, Representative Long, do you want to start? Sure, happy to. Well, um, I think it's going to be an exciting session. This is a historic uh, surplus. And so I think it gives us a real opportunity to um, to look at some uh, some of the big challenges that we have as a state and try to try to address those. And certainly, I think um, the climate challenge is one that we uh, take very seriously. We, um, uh, Representative Hansen and I were uh, part of a rollout of a, a climate action plan that uh, we put together with um, chairs of uh, other committees, the Tr Transportation Committee, uh, Capital Investment Committee, um, uh, and Agriculture, uh, to, uh, to name a few. And so we um, have a billion dollar proposal um, across those five committees, which includes substantial investment in, in transit, um, which include, I'll let uh, Representative Hansen talk about some of the working lands pieces. And uh, in the energy space, we have uh, proposals for uh, weatherization, for um, trying to uh, get some funding for uh, renewable energy deployment through a, a innovative finance authority and for establishing a Greater Minnesota Renewable Development Account. Those are a few of our ideas, and um, but we're we're certainly hoping that this will be a big session for for energy and for climate issues, and um, we have uh, we're going to be uh, I think pushing ideas across a, a broad uh, range of committees. Well, Representative Hansen, do you want to add to that from the from the House side on what this session is going to look like for Minnesotans? Well, I think it's going to be a very uh, challenging and confusing session, more than usual, uh, Representative Long mentioned some of the focus, but we start next Monday um, and then Tuesday, our precinct caucuses. Uh, our first committee on the environment will be on Thursday. Uh, and, but I really, having been through redistricting before, and I think Senator Senjum has been, things will get very chaotic uh, after February 15th uh, because it's just going to be, legislators are going to be distracted. You're already seeing a large number of members that are announcing their retirement, I think there will be more disruption. So uh, having contact with legislators now and throughout the session is very important. It's also gonna be very difficult. In the environment area, I, I'm 
say we're probably going to do three things. One is trying to right some past wrongs. Um, we have some legacy landfill problems and past problems that we'd like to resolve uh, in the past where some of our funds have been taken. Funds, when I say our, I mean Minnesota's funds have been taken out of dedicated dollars uh, and put into the general fund uh, where we'd like to reverse that with this one-time money and ongoing money. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, reform some of the things that we're doing now. And I, I realize there's some sound in the background, so I hope that's not too distracting. Um, right, uh, doing some reform. Uh, one of our first bills that we have up is an example of that. It's a small bill, but asking the Department of Natural Resources to look at uh, what are defined as rough fish. Uh, in 2022, do we still consider some fish game fish and some fish rush, rough fish? Or do we need to be looking at how we, we protect and manage all fish? It's a different way of looking at things, something that, uh, you know, not considering um, some of our natural resources disposable, uh, but are part of the ecosystem that we all live in. So it's a small bill, but it's an example of trying to look with new eyes at some of the systems that we have, uh, even though it's just a minor thing, it's fish. Um, and then looking in the future, how do we prepare and plan for the climate change disruptions that we have and look at water quality um, and waste. We need to improve our recycling rate dramatically. Um, with COVID, there has been a heck of a lot of more plastic waste that has gone into landfills and we've got to figure out a way of managing that into the future. So those are kind of three general areas that we'll be looking at. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Senator Sendrum, what about a, a sneak preview from the Senate side? What is your caucus looking to do and what do you think session is gonna look like? Uh, the uh, the session is going to look like, uh, and I'll, let me just back up a half a step. I, I, I think we all know the last year, year and a half, uh, uh, Legis legislation just gender the process of legislation hasn't probably been what it should be and and it probably isn't going to be all it, it should be this year uh, uh, albeit the senate will be so-called open uh, uh, and accessible to the public uh, uh, it's not without locked elevators and appointments and things like that uh, nonetheless uh, we we are going to be operating in a hybrid motion or uh, mode rather so that uh, People can come to the Capitol. They can certainly visit us in our offices. Uh, they uh, they can participate uh, again uh, in testimony either uh, in person or, or virtually. Uh, but it's not kind of the way that uh, many of us uh, remember the legislative process as being. And so it's it's a little agonizing that way. Uh, uh, it's it's reality and. We need to do it, but uh, it's uh, it's just it's just made more difficult. And I, I, I really do feel that, that that the public voice is not heard as efficiently as effectively as it as it like used to be. And uh, so we just have to try harder, I guess. But uh, from the standpoint of uh, just looking at priorities, it's uh, from our perspective, at least in the Senate, is uh, we've got a, a, a major surplus. Uh, it's uh, what do we give back and, and what do we uh, save to you know add to uh, efficient programs. I think we tend to think this is one-time cash and we ought to apply it to the extent possible to one-time needs. Uh, in, in that respect, uh, and especially certainly in the environmental area, and, uh, I, I, I've spent most of my legislative life in the, in the circles of the bonding committee. Uh, uh, a, a lot of money on wastewater infrastructure. Uh, if you get it uh, around Minnesota at all, you'll find out very quickly there, in particular our small cities are, uh, are have, have systems that are generally, you know, very old, and very antiquated, and in many cases non-compliant. And, uh, and we do have an opportunity now with uh, some cash. It's not enough by all means, but to, uh, to add to, you know, to, to maybe help in that area, the, 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 uh, the landfill situation, uh, major, major costs all across Minnesota there. Uh, uh, I, I would say we should never cite another landfill in Minnesota. I mean, they're just, there's become state liabilities and somebody will pay for them at some point. Uh, thinking about uh, the, uh, my, my committee in particular, we, we certainly, I, I thought uh, 
Well, I just tell you, many people tell us we had a pretty good energy year last year, uh, and uh, that's in the eyes of the beholder, I suppose. But uh, I'll take it uh, as it is, and, and those comments are nice, and we'll, we'll just continue to build on that. I enjoy working with the representative along, and we've got a good relationship, and uh, and uh, we're going to push the envelope uh, certainly on, uh, on decarbonization uh, in every respect. Uh, certainly, I think uh, we we've, we've done a pretty good job clutching the utilities along. We're certainly getting into the to the transportation sector now and uh, and the building sector and the things like that. So we'll be we'll be going down those roads. But uh, it's a uh, it's going to be an interesting session. Uh, but uh, as uh, Representative Hansen said, it's going to be it's going to be short. We've got short deadlines. Uh, March 25th uh, doesn't give us a lot of time, frankly, to to dwell into into uh, the topics the way I think we we ought to and we should. Uh, I, I'm frankly opposed to that that early a deadline, but uh, you know leaders have made that up. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to vote for it on the floor, to be honest with you. But <laughs> but it's uh, it's the way it is. So we're going to we're going to have to work pretty fast paced. It's uh, just the way it is. And uh, understanding that uh, there's a lot on the table, but uh, a fairly short time to uh, before that first deadline, and uh, we're just going to have to work hard. So thank you. Awesome. So building off kind of what you, you mentioned, Senator Sanjo, about some of the accomplishments of last year, um, let's just talk a little bit more about what environment and energy legislation passed last year and, you know, what you're thinking um, on how that's going to be built out in 2022. Uh, I don't know oh, uh, if you want to start that first and then we'll kick over to your colleagues. Now, I, so. wish I, I wish I had my list, <laughs> but, you know, certainly, uh, you know, a, a lot of uh, a lot of things in this, you know, the solar world, uh, solar on school, solar rewards. So. Uh, uh, solar schools, even if you will, for the uh, for the college uh, sector. I think we, as I think about next year, we just uh, we've got an opportunity to to add money to those uh, those worlds. We uh, I see uh, Susan Turbis is on here. We worked on renewable natural gas. Uh, I don't know if there's uh, any additional legislation that's needed to help us along. I think that's kind of on its journey and uh, and going. Uh, just we just did a number of things you know, weatherization from the standpoint of uh, helping people and, and in particular this uh, thinking just about this energy assistance and and as we think about equity it's 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 somewhat it's 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 kind of difficult to to find sometimes in, in our world i think but certainly in the weatherization energy assistance uh, i think we'll certainly do well there we passed the equal bill last year that's it takes us on a on a journey towards uh, Additional conservation uh, will certainly work with the building efficiency this year. So uh, the menu is uh, kind of wide open, uh, but I would say building off last year and uh, and just uh, you know taking taking us one step further and uh, along this uh, decarbonization journey. Uh, it's it's uh, it's a journey that uh, it's not an overnight thing, and uh, some people would like it to be, but uh, it uh, probably goes fast as technology will take us. Uh, certainly, battery technology innovation, I think, is going to be something we talk, look at and try to fund to the extent possible, whether it's uh, storage uh, uh, modalities, hydrogen batteries, et cetera. I'm honestly thinking about uh, in, uh, as we got into the medical device industry in Minnesota, we, we amped it up with tax credits, and maybe there's a way to amp up uh, this uh, uh, storage uh, phenomena that we need to certainly engage in. Maybe we can use some tax credits to to incent some development there in Minnesota. So uh, it's an exciting time and uh, just fun to be a part of it. Well, Representative Long, uh, do you have anything to add there on what you think the accomplishments were last year and how you're gonna build on it in 22? I think Senator Sengem had a, had a good uh, good summary of our uh, many accomplishments. I think the ECO Act in particular was a hard fought win that took many years to, to get across to help um, help expand and improve our energy efficiency uh, programs in the state. So I'm uh, was really excited we were able to get that done. A few ad additional areas I'll mention, we had a, a revolving loan fund set up for the uh, for state government to help make their buildings more energy efficient, which I think will be um, a great model and, and can make a big difference in terms of uh, reducing the energy usage for our, our state. Uh, and we also, I think, did a um, had some really innovative progress in the energy transition and what that means for, for communities. So we set up uh, an energy transition office at 
at uh, the Department of uh, Employment and Economic Development to focus on the question of helping support workers and communities that uh, might otherwise get left behind uh, in the energy transition. I think that's uh, going to be um, important going forward. We also uh, set up a study for um, looking at using state dollars for um, buy clean and uh, what that might mean in the future. So um, whether or not we could um, use our state purchasing, for example, to buy cleaner steel um, for uh, for the construction that we're doing and and uh, uh, you know rewarding companies that are doing uh, better better by our environment. So I think that will be exciting. And we had uh, I thought some really innovative and interesting funding um, projects. So helped uh, fund an expansion of our uh, solar manufacturer on the Iron Range. Uh, we helped um, uh, fund a, a project in North Minneapolis to uh, train folks for uh, the new energy economy that's coming. Um, and uh, uh, we also funded some really exciting microgrid uh, research at uh, St. Thomas. So, so some great projects and, and I know that there's a, a lot to build on. Anything to add there, Representative Hansen? I think one of the successes we had dealt with both energy and water. And you may not think of it this way, but tree planting uh, deals with energy and water. There's a lot of water storage, but also energy uh, cost reduction and energy savings when we have trees. Uh, my block in South St. Paul lost 13 ash trees uh, last summer. And uh, what that does for heating and cooling in those buildings and just uh, not only the aesthetics, but the energy use in those in that street uh, is real. Uh, so we were able to put some money in for grants to local governments for uh, tree planting. We have a goal, a, a small goal, and that's to plant one tree for each Minnesotan each year for the next four years. So 5.7 million trees is not too much to ask, but we need to get a lot of trees in the ground. And I think we can build build upon the success we had last year in the environment. Uh, we have a lot of ash trees coming down. We have a lot of trees coming down from storm damage. And so replacing trees, also resuscitating some old legacy programs like uh, uh, farmstead windbreaks and uh, uh, living snow fences along our roads with trees. There's things that we can do. The old technology we have, something as simple as planting a tree, we just need to gear that up. So that means uh, enhancing uh, the DNR nursery, but also going into the private market. We're gonna need different ages of trees, different species of trees and adaptability on trees. And we need to get them planted soon. Perfect, well, uh, Representative Hansen, maybe I'll stay with you for this next question. Um, so the House DFL and the Climate Action Caucus, you, you know, I think Representative Long touched on this too. You guys uh, announced your $1 billion climate action plan. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about what's in the proposal and if you think you can gain bipartisan support on it uh, this session to get that passed? I think you're muted, Representative Hansen. It's cold in my truck. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, like, any like any legislation, uh, usually uh, there's going to be compromise. Uh, there are going to be things that maybe Senator Senjum could uh, uh, pass in the Senate uh, that uh, we have in the House proposal, there may be some things that he can't and vice versa. But I think, you know, as uh, Representative Long mentioned, I think the, the weatherization, the commerce, those energy efficiency, building upgrades, I think there's probably strong bipartisan support on that. I think hopefully we've had the precedent on tree planting, both on uh, public and private land, uh, water storage, uh, and uh, some cover crops. I think there could be some opportunity for uh, uh, CREP has been a very positive program for for many years. So there's federal money on the table. And I think in general, wherever there's federal money that can match, uh, I, I, there's been a history of bipartisan support for trying to get uh, those projects uh, in the ground to have real change uh, soon. Representative Long, anything to add about you know that package? I know you're. I think you're a co-author on it. Or yes, I, I don't think there's an, uh, anything in the package that's particularly ideological. I think it's a uh, a list of 
um, projects that we think will, will help move us forward on, on uh, addressing climate. Um, and as I mentioned, it's across five committees. So there's a pretty broad range of things that are in here, but you know, in the transportation area, there's more funding for bus rapid transit lines, which I think has gotten bipartisan support um, in the past. And um, in the built environment area, uh, Representative Hansen mentioned weatherization, which is uh, one that, that we have been working closely with uh, um, the Commerce Department on trying to figure out what, what the needs are. And we as a state haven't put state money into weatherization in the past. Um, our neighbors uh, to the east, Wisconsin, do put state money in. And so they do about five times more buildings per year um, that they weatherize than we do. So it, it does feel like that could be an area where uh, we could we could find some bipartisan agreement to try to uh, increase our, our work in state and help more people uh, uh, afford their energy bills and stay warm in their homes. Um, and then I think in the, uh, in the uh, energy space, um, a number of the proposals, I think, are ones that we've talked about in the past. We have some additional um, money in there to do, to build on sort of our solar in schools model and think about solar on other public buildings. And so we, we talked about um, uh, universities, but also looking at, um, uh, you know, public public administration buildings or um, wastewater treatment plants or airports or, or things like that, where we might might be able to to think about um, reducing energy costs for other other public infrastructure. So. I think we have some some good ideas in there and we'll certainly uh, you know bring them forward in the session and see where we get. Well, Senator Sajum, have you looked at that at all or any thoughts? Uh, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, uh, Representative Hanson's a tree proposal. I I find that very interesting, intriguing and 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 then who doesn't like a tree? Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm certainly thinking we ought to do that. Uh, you know, the what we in, in the bonding committee, uh, and, and we continue to see this uh, uh, stream bank erosion is a is a is a really big area, and particularly along the Minnesota River, it seems. But uh, uh, and as uh, and but frankly, probably most of our rivers, as we uh, as our storms intensify and and the water uh, runs quicker or more quickly why I mean uh, we're taking a lot of soil and putting it into our rivers and in some cases into lakes and so on and so forth and uh, to the extent we can we've got certainly the buffer program but uh, you know tr trees along the river bank help stabilize and and so we kind of get a twofer on that and, uh, and, and in addition to that even even in the city of Rochester we work pretty hard on trees here but uh, uh, they they come they go they don't sometimes get replanted uh, uh at, at a frequency that they ought to and i and we can just amplify that uh, over the course of 850 cities across minnesota uh, i think uh, the urban forest is an important uh, i think uh, cleanser for our air and uh, and certainly provider of shade uh, and cooling for our houses in many cases so that that's an intriguing and interesting thought and uh, i hope we can take that up either in my committee or the environmental committee and but uh, I just think I think we're, we 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 we've got a we've got a good I think uh, mindset between Representative Long and I, and uh, I think we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do okay. We're gonna we're gonna build on last year, and uh, and uh, I'm confident about that. I'm I'm, I'm not doing this because uh, I want to I want to be in neutral. <laughs> you either you, you there is no neutral. You're either going forward or backward. And I want to take I want to certainly take our caucus forward in, uh, in this area and, uh, and certainly in the energy transition uh, uh, journey that we're on. It's uh, it's important we do that. Wonderful. Thanks everybody. Um, Bonding has come up a few times now. Let's talk a little bit about bonding. So the second year is traditionally considered the bonding year at the Capitol. Um, you know, now it seems like there's almost a bonding proposal every year, but generally it's the second year of the biennium. Uh, Governor Walls unveiled his $2.7 billion package uh, that included quite a bit around environmental stewardship and climate change. Uh, he had flood hazard mitigation, electrical vehicle charging infrastructure, bus rapid transit uh, were some of the proposals in there. Um, I know the House and Senate Capital Investment Committees will also release plans being probably both significantly smaller and maybe larger than the governor's plan. Um, I know some numbers have been thrown around, but let's just talk a little bit about, you know, bonding. Um, what do you think it's going to look like this session? What are your priorities uh, in the capital investment bill? And do you think uh, it'll get passed heading into an election year? 
Uh, Representative Long, why don't we start with you? Well, on, on all things bonding, I'm gonna to defer to Senator Centrum to, to kick us off. <laughs> uh, well, okay, so uh, uh, it's, it's interesting. Our, our, our constitution requires that uh, the bonding process originate in the house. And I, I've gone many years wishing that wasn't the case. <laughs> and there have been years when we just uh, uh, actually moved a, a bill forward in the Senate, uh, approved it and laid it on the table. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, we're, we, 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 we want to work with the house and putting together a good bonding bill. And, uh, you know, the, the last one that, uh, that I did as I was chair was, one point eight 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 million dollars. So uh, a lot of, uh, you know, the biggest ever. And uh, I, I don't think Senator Bach is going to let that stand very long on our side. Uh, he uh, he'll probably want to up me on that one. But uh, I, I, we'll have a good year. But it, 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 it's roads and bridges, waste waste. As I mentioned earlier, wastewater infrastructure needs are are, are really uh, uh, paramount. Uh, landfill cleanups, uh, those kind of things. Uh, uh, you know, certainly the wetlands and trying to keep water on the land is a is an important thing from the standpoint of uh, of just clean water in general. Uh, but we've got a lot of we have a lot of wastewater needs across Minnesota, and uh, and uh, I'm I'm just hopeful that we and and way more than frankly a even a it would probably take ten billion dollars to even come close to 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 tapping the need in, in that area. Uh, but uh, to the extent we can, I, I hope that we can put a, a substantial amount in the, in their wastewater infrastructure systems because uh, they in fact uh, do a lot, you know, the non point sources are one thing, but to the sources we can control are at the, at the end of, of the city waste uh, treatment systems and, uh, and we ought to be able to do that better and we need to. So I'm hopeful in that respect. What about on the house side? Uh, what do you two think about bonding this year? Well, I think uh, a key is uh, what are the state needs for matching federal dollars on the infrastructure bill? Uh, there are some uh, opportunities that are there with ports and obviously with transportation and wastewater. I think the challenge to bring it back to climate and equity is how do we, how do we have that balance but also provide innovation? So wastewater, um, with this opportunity, with federal money and with the opportunity that we may have with a lot of state money, whether it's bonding or cash, why would we just keep doing the same thing? Building a square building of cinder block and having uh, the, the dilution and mixing going on there. We should incorporate, if we can, uh, solar. Uh, it doesn't do any good just to build the building and not have anybody to operate it. We need to have programs for their wastewater treatment operators and systems um, and build in the innovation if we're gonna invest this money. Uh, in many communities, wastewater treatment is a large energy user because a lot of the buildings are uh, almost 100 years old. Uh, they are very, um, their cinder block usually have a square roof or a square building with a flat roof, may have a large campus. Um, I think the same thing applies if we're investing in our technical colleges, community colleges, and universities. We've got a lot of flat roofs out there that are uh, uh, public buildings that we could invest in. So innovation is a key in the capital investment. Often the discussion we have is where are we going to put the money and how much and how big? But I think one of the questions is how do we do it differently? How do we keep evolving in this environment? to make things better, uh, to design them better when we have this money, rather than just replicating what we've done in the past. And that's hard. It's hard because um, it's hard for the legislature, it's hard for the agencies, it's hard for the localities because the easiest thing to do is to do what you've always done. And putting that catalyst of creativity in there is I think something we need to discuss as we're investing with this money with the people's money, the state money going in there, we can ask for or require changes to how we build things to make things better. And I think you're gonna see that. Um, the federal money, there's not only the appropriations process where more may be coming, but the infrastructure bill is significant. Um, we don't have to do things the way we've always done them. 
And I think that's where we need your help is saying, we have to try innovation with our capital investments. But we also need to think about the operating and how do we provide the training for the next generation to be operating systems that are gonna be lasting their lifetime, not just ours. I think those were good. I'll just add briefly, um, I think that uh, transit should be a huge priority in, in the bonding bill. And, and I think that was uh, one of the uh, items that we focused quite a bit on in, in our um, climate action proposal we rolled out. Um, so certainly there's a lot of um, bus rapid transit projects ready to go and some greater Minnesota transit that we're, we're hoping to fund as well. Um, and then I would just mention electric vehicle infrastructure. I think that that's something that could come through bonding or could come through um, general fund appropriation. There's renewable development account. There's lots of ways that we can can get at that, but I think we're we're pretty far behind as a state, and we know the direction that uh, the the vehicle manufacturers are going, and they've only accelerated in the last year in terms of announcements and timelines. And so, I think we need to be uh, ready as a state to help uh, help Minnesotans uh, drive the cars that are coming and and that are here now. So I think we need to do a lot of um, a lot of more build out in the yeah, EV infrastructure space. Anyone want to take a guess on what the final bonding number will be? <laughs> no, no one wants to throw in a throw in an over under. 2.3. 2 2.3. 2.98. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is recorded, so it's going to be fun to come back in <laughs> July and see how we were. How there we you did. Go. See if you can win a bet. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Representative Long, you kind of touched on, uh, you know, that that car companies are investing more and more in electric electric vehicles, and that's what consumers are looking about. Um, let's just talk about a little bit about the business community. Um, you know, I think they're playing an ever greater role in sustainability and clean energy. They have commitments to communities and consumers. They're advancing equity initiatives. They're working toward carbon neutrality. How is private sector leadership impacting public sector policy decision making? Well, that's a great question. And I think that with the clean energy transition comes some uh, enormous opportunities for, for job creation and economic growth uh, for the state of Minnesota. And that's in, in a wide range of sectors, certainly in the um, renewable energy space. We uh, heard uh, testimony in our, our committee from David Mortensen of uh, Mortensen Construction. And they were, because the state of Minnesota was an early mover on, on wind uh, back in the day in the 90s, they were one of the first developers to get out there and uh, start some wind construction projects. And now between um, Mortensen and Blattner, uh, in the last decade, Minnesota companies have installed over half of all wind turbines across the country, uh, which is remarkable in terms of the amount of job creation that that has had for our state and the, the economic benefit it's, it's had here. So certainly in the renewable energy space, um, but I think in the in the vehicle space, we had a really exciting startup company come uh, talk to our committee, Zeus Electric Chassis, that is uh, the first manufacturer of um, bucket trucks that are electric for for utility companies and other small companies, and um, and they're uh, you know based here in Minnesota and and are just getting started. So uh, so there's room for large companies, there's room for small companies, there's a lot of innovation happening. Um, I'll mention one other we had. We've had a geothermal uh, startup come uh, talk to our company, to our committee that ha had an installation um, at the pipe fitters union of a, of a innovative geothermal technology that came out of the University of Minnesota. So we, I think uh, this space is one where business voices are important. We're going to need uh, to have uh, businesses, um, you know, that are, are rolling out the clean energy tr transition across uh, across all of these sectors and. Um, and I think we have some real leadership in, in our state uh, from the business community. We have a number of uh, businesses that have made climate commitments that have committed to reach uh, the Paris Accord uh, target levels. Um, and we have uh, utilities that I think have really led in a lot of ways on, on uh, decarbonization. We have at this point, I think 80% of all Minnesotans uh, are uh, live in a utility, utility territory that is committed to 100% decarbonization. So that's, uh, those are exciting steps in progress and certainly gives us a lot to, a lot to build on and partner with. 
Senator Sanjum, I'll ask the same question to you. How is private sector leadership impacting uh, public sector decision making? Uh, I, I, it, it is, I believe, and it 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 just uh, it just I think makes it a little easier from the standpoint of uh, of. Uh, uh, general overall acceptance. There's, you know, certainly on the energy uh, transition world, there's uh, there's skeptics with respect to reliability and affordability and so on. But uh, yet, uh, when you see our major corporations, in particular, leading the way, uh, understanding that uh, it's important from the standpoint of a of a business perspective that that they need to lead lead the way. They need to be, if you will, clean and green and. Uh, and, and certainly many of our, our larger corporations understand that from the standpoint of markets and uh, and uh, customer needs. Uh, and that, that's really helpful. And uh, Representative Long mentioned our utilities. Uh, uh, I think just generally speaking, uh, they have really stepped up, uh, uh, may in fact be some of the more progressive utility is in, in the world in terms of their initiatives and their pursuits for uh, a clean energy future. So. So it really does help. Uh, uh, I, I remember well the president of General Mills, or the CEO at least, as he was running for regents a couple of years ago, and they all visit our offices and so on. I was, I was talking about him at that point, uh, or to him at that point about my 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 vision, which is, it's it's still strong, although I don't chair the bonding committee. But I I, I wanted to build a major center for. Uh, uh, energy and environmental sustainability university uh, uh, which would which would be a kind of a cross sector thing that would bring uh, uh, various uh, academic disciplines together with commercial disciplines and uh, and in my mind we would lead the future in, uh, not only educationally but certainly in research and development patents and everything like that and uh, uh, well that hasn't happened yet but uh, you know dare to dream but uh, but anyway this uh, the CEO of General Mills was telling me that he said David you don't know you don't know how important environmental sustainability is to our product line at General Mills, uh, all the way from you know the the, the product planted in the fields to you know the box that it's put in as it uh, and the transportation that leaves the leaves the building. So it's uh, it, it's something that I think is uh, certainly very important to us. Uh, they in many ways are are leading the way, and uh, and they understand it. Uh, uh, from the standpoint of just customer demand and, and frankly, uh, I think a, uh, in many cases, a, a moral uh, pursuit that's important to them corporately. So, uh, so it is important. And in fact, I, you know, I probably Senator or Representative Long as well has brought them to the testimony table just to, and we probably will this year as well to give us examples of where they are in terms of uh, of, of their environmental future because uh, it's important for us to know that and to, and to continue to hear it. Thank you. Representative Hansen, anything to add there? Sometimes the legislature is burdened by nostalgia and anecdote. Um, and I think the business community uh, may be out front uh, of the legislature on a number of issues. I mentioned earlier that we're in a time of great disruption. You know, not only with the pandemic, but at the legislature with uh, with COVID uh, at the legislature, but also many members leaving uh, and there's going to be great change. There could be uh, a large number of people leaving both voluntarily and involuntarily uh, in the next year. And so I would invite the business community to invite us to their community meetings, like if there's a lunchtime meeting or a session and I'm not talking about campaigning here and I'm not talking about politics. I'm talking about we work for you as a representative or your senator. Uh, you know, invite your local representatives in and ask them these questions and the discussion that we're having here or anything else. Um, with Zoom, that does offer the opportunity for us to explain what we're doing and what we're working on and what we should be working on. So I think where business is being creative and being out front, they could share some of the innovation that they're doing and that members, legislators may not be aware of. They may not be aware of the changes that are occurring in business. Let's assume that they can come and that they can learn and that we should be involved. I would invite you to invite us uh, to have those discussions. And hopefully, as we move out of the Zoom world and back into in-person meetings and getting together throughout the summer and that, when people knock on your door, ask them questions. 
when people show up at parades and community festivals, talk to them. We're not that scary, most of us. Um, but, uh, you know, have that conversation. And that's why I was starting off at the coffee shop this morning, because there's nothing like reality with people telling you and asking you questions. The minute I walked in there, people walked up to me and had questions about when does the legislature start and what's happening. And I, I think that's what we have to do. We have to get back to that representation. And we represent the business community as well as the labor community and uh, folks throughout the state. So invite us in and share your thoughts. We can do it a little bit easier now with Zoom uh, during the noon hour or after, after work. It is going to get hectic. You're going to have legislators that say it's hectic, but even a half hour, hey, get to know you. Here's something that our business is working on uh, would be helpful. It helps us shape legislation. Thank you. I think that kind of helps transition into the, uh, my next question just about engaging in policy conversations. So um, I think 2020, we really saw the new focus uh, after the murder of George Floyd on diversity, equity, and inclusion. I think it's something everybody's talking about. We're all still talking about. Um, importantly, how have the past two years changed how you approach legislation or engagement uh, with constituents and various stakeholder groups at the Capitol in your districts? Are you hearing from new groups or stakeholders that maybe weren't traditionally engaged in, in policy conversations that are now kind of coming to the table and wanting to talk with you? Rosa Hanson, I'll start with you since we're talking about folks engaging. It, it has frankly been hard for the traditional meetings and um, and even Zoom because you have the technology and the time questions. So um, as this has continued, as the pandemic has continued, I think there's been a hunger for in-person and connection. And so there are more people and newer people that are engaging. Um, I, uh, our local chamber group has a monthly meeting. It's called Local Issues. They get together uh, 7.30 to 8.30 the last Wednesday of the month. Um, and that has continued throughout the pandemic virtually. So I think the people who are connected, you know, through process who are used to doing this uh, have been still doing it, but frankly, getting new folks engaged um, is harder. It's just been harder with the pandemic. Um, it's harder when the Capitol is closed. Uh, it's harder when there's not the the tradition we had that moment during the summer where people were out and about uh, more often right after a vaccination and you did have uh, new people coming uh, my district is changing i have a, a lot of communities of color uh people uh again showing up at the coffee shop showing up at community events being and being visible and i'm looking forward to door knocking again because the best way to get that pulse of what people are thinking and feeling and how you can get them involved is by door knocking on their door. And we weren't able to do that in the last campaign. And I think that made an impact because people were, were only on technology and we have to have the in-person to, to provide for the equity, to be getting new people involved. Uh, I when I was in the coffee shop here, I was trying to explain the precinct caucus system to people. That was very difficult. <laughs> so how do you, we have to look at the burdens that we have in these systems for people to participate. And there are many. Um, and I, it's not just the legislature. I know the churches are having difficulty with this, all community uh, events. Uh, how, do you, how do you get people involved? And people want to be involved. And unfortunately, their involvement may be scrolling the phone. Um, and that's not enough of engagement of face-to-face, -face, in person. How do we get something done? Thank you. Representative Long, uh, Senator Sunjum, anything to add on that question? I, I would say, and, and, and Representative Hampson, I think, said it so well. I don't, I, I'm not going to be re, re, repeating any of that except uh, well, well said. Uh, and it, it and it is it is frankly frustrating because it's uh, it's been so difficult to to to, to get out with the groups uh, uh, you know so many cancellations of everything I don't care if it's Rochester Fest or or you know all all, all the community events so so many of them uh, have gone Zoom and 
And so we don't interact like we used to uh, even casually interact and, and, and we're missing something because of it. So uh, I don't think uh, any of us can uh, uh, hope, uh, uh, all of us would hope so that, uh, that we can get back to normal as soon as possible because I think it, it, it has affected our, our, our cross cultures and our cross relationships and all those communications which are so vital to, to uh, you know, public service as we all want to do it. Well, and I'll, I'll just add, Chelsea, to the um, trying to have to hear from diverse viewpoints in our committee and, and bring in voices from across the state. We've certainly tried hard to do that um, in the Climate and Energy Committee. And uh, I saw the, the question from uh, Angela in the chat on um, environmental justice. Our uh, second hearing um, of the session um, next week on next Thursday, the Climate and Energy Committee is going to be on climate justice in particular. Uh, and just trying to hear from community about um, the impacts that they're they're feeling and experiencing, and uh, often uh, disproportionately borne by by communities of color, and what what that could mean for our policy making. So we'll be hearing from Cecilia Martinez, who is a Minnesotan, but until recently was the head environmental justice person in the Center for Environmental Quality for President Biden, um, and uh, so was graciously giving us some of her time, and then also from the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, which tracks um, the disproportionate burdens borne uh, by, by pollution in communities across the state. And then we'll be hearing from community members as well. So I'd encourage folks to, to tune into that uh, next Thursday if you're interested. Thank you. Um, maybe going off that a little bit, just because of you know COVID and the, the back to normal, which hopefully soon. Um, but do you think, you know, when things uh, open up more at the House and Senate again, that you're going to be hearing from more folks um, than you you have been now and maybe new groups who never thought they could or, you know, did engage with the legislature before who now really want to have a, a seat at the table and a voice? Do you think that's going to going to change as the House and Senate kind of open up and we do get back to, to normal whenever that is? So not to anyone who wants to answer. No, I'm just, I'm just going to say, I, I hope so, but, you know, I've gone through about a couple of years now, and, and maybe to some extent, people are, are going to have to learn how to do this again, or the, the fact that, uh, you know, the doors are open, it's it's their capital, and it it it, it may happen somewhat more slowly, I think, than we all wish. Uh, I hope not, but uh, I could, uh, if you're not used to doing something for a couple of years, it, it takes you a couple of years to get used to doing it again. And that's what I'm saying. And uh, so we'll see, I guess, nobody knows. I hope so. <laughs> I, I think part of it is not just uh, dealing with groups uh, because uh, sometimes we, we have to figure out a way to speak or to listen to the voiceless, um, you know, and I'd mentioned before about the connected. That's not just the, the well-off and the well-connected will always have representation. And there will always be groups at the Capitol. They come and change and it's come and, come and go. It's important for people to band together to amplify their voice. But as legislators, when we're representing everybody in our district, we have to listen. We have to find and listen to the voiceless who may not be part of any group. They may be there and we have to have that openness. We have to open our ears and open our eyes and open our hearts. And that's not just scheduling the meeting with a group. It's having to change our perspective on equity. And that involves our acknowledging our history and looking at what's happening now and how do we adapt for the future. And it's gotta be baked in to what we're doing um, and it is very, very hard to do that. There's only 24 hours in the day, but not only as legislators, but as Minnesotans, I think we have to do that. We have to listen and, and fight and seek out the voiceless or the dispossessed and find a way of listening to them. And that is something individually we need to do, whether we're at the Capitol or not. 
Um, you know, so just kind of touching off that a little bit, um, you know, we have a diverse group on today, uh, you know, some lobbyists and, and folks and organizations that are very active at the Capitol, uh, but for those who may not be as active, just, you know, how can the folks on the call today support what you're doing, collaborate with you as a leader? Um, you know, I know we keep touching on COVID, but, you know, what is the best way if, you know, they want to work with you on policy or share what they're doing? I just popped into the chat uh, our committee website um, for folks interested in following our work on on committee. You can sign up for updates. There's an email list uh, that our our we uh, um, you'll get the first notice for committee meetings that are coming up, and then uh, information on how to tune in for uh, hearings we have coming up. But then I just also encourage folks to uh, reach out to us directly. Certainly speaking for for myself, we. Um, particularly if it's on a, on a topic relevant to our committee, we're always interested in hearing from uh, Minnesotans on what's on their mind and I read my email. So uh, not too hard to get a hold of me at the state legislature. It might be harder to reach out to folks at the federal level or <laughs> other, uh, uh, other, other levels, but I think that uh, we're, we're pretty accessible. And so uh, really uh, looking forward to engaging with all the, all the perspectives and um, insight that this group has to offer. Senator Sanjum, anything to add there? Uh, no, except I'm not as technically adept. Uh, so, uh, but just know if you go onto the uh, Senate website and uh, scroll down to the Energy Committee, there's a there's a link there that you can uh, you can uh, get, get all the committee notifications as well. Uh, I just don't know how to put it in the chat. <laughs> but uh, no, I would say I would say uh, to Senator uh, Representative Long that uh, same thing that. Uh, you know what why do we do this uh uh we do this as a sense of public service and uh and it's pretty deeply embedded in, in a lot of us and uh and and we're here to listen uh, we're here to learn uh to a reasonable extent i i think we would do almost anything to uh to uh to get input from people on issues uh, uh whether it's an office meeting whether i i come to uh your 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 location or whether you come to mine uh in person uh or, or whether we zoom or call or email or, or whatever just just know that uh as we sign up for this kind of thing uh we have committed ourselves to this public service uh journey and and uh, often to the extents of our own personal life but that that's 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 what we do and because I think there's just this deeply embedded feeling that I think we all have that uh, we we come to this world to you know to journey or this place rather than make the world a better place, and we work as hard as we can uh, to do that. Uh, sometimes uh, not certainly perfect, but uh, but we do have a sense of service, and we want to serve, and we want to hear what, as uh, Representative Hansen just so aptly said, we want to hear what each and every person uh has to has to tell us and it's and it's hard but uh you know deep down in our hearts that's that's why we serve and uh, and we want to serve on behalf of the people we represent it's just simple as that thank you uh representative hansen did you have anything that i saw you on mute i'll be uh short show up share and if you see something say something uh, if you see us at the grocery store or at the coffee shop or at the gas station, come up and uh, ask us a question. We work for you. Um, there's going to be great change at the legislature this year. Uh, be part of it. Thank you. Um, so at this time, you know, I, I guess I would ask uh, our lawmakers if they have any closing thoughts uh, that they want to share. And then if there are folks who have questions, uh, drop them in the chat box. I know it's been a good conversation today, but I don't want anyone who may have a question on a specific policy or something we touched on today to miss out. So um, while we go there, Senator Senjum, do you have anything you want to just say to kind of wrap up? This no, just, uh, well, thank you for the opportunity for us to do this, first of all. Uh, again, as I just said, know that uh, uh, we're we're in public service. And so we're here to serve the, the needs of the people of Minnesota. Uh, whether they're in our, frankly, or in our district, or whether they're outside of our district, if uh, there's something that uh, 
that you think that I could be of uh, help to you with uh, either uh, within the jurisdiction of my committee or even outside it, uh, uh, we uh, we we are here to serve, and we're, we're certainly willing to do this. And uh, and then and be ambassadors. Uh, uh, this is an certainly an environmentally orientated group. There's no question about that. Uh, you know, be ambassadors of, uh, of 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 the movement, if you will. Uh, be those people that. Uh, that make it okay to be an environmentalist, and uh, and I know that you do that each and every day, uh, but to the extent uh, public mood uh, drives uh, our thoughts uh, and our collective thoughts of the legislature, that's that's all the better, and uh, we'll have a better world because of it. So, thank you so much. Thank you, Representative Long. Oh, I just appreciate the conversation and all the good questions and. I think we're going to have uh, an engaging and interesting session. So we we'll just encourage folks to uh, to pay attention and and let us know what you think and how we should be uh, uh, spending our our resources and our time and our energy. So I appreciate uh, uh, the conversation today and look forward to many conversations to come. Representative Hanson. Uh, when there's so much work to do, it often seems overwhelming. We've all been through, uh, you know, essentially unprecedented times. But I want everyone to know that each person makes a difference. We can have an impact. Um, don't get discouraged. There is such an opportunity for change this year. We have, on the bright side, an unprecedented uh, federal government opportunity for infrastructure and doing things differently. Uh, we have great change occurring in the makeup of the legislature. Please get involved. Uh, we can get things done. Uh, we can have Minnesota work again. Uh, it is the new, new normal will be different. And that new normal uh, can only happen with you shaping it. So please, please participate. We look forward to it. I don't see any questions popping up in the chat box. Um, so I just wanted to thank again, uh, our three lawmakers for being here. I think we had a really good discussion today. Um, I really appreciate you all taking the time and I know Environmental Initiative does as well. This is a great organization. So um, with that, I'll kick it back over to Christina and just thank you again, uh, everybody for the conversation and for, for letting me join you all today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Chelsea, for moderating uh, today's conversation and to our lawmakers for the great conversation and sharing our 2022 priorities with us. Um, I wanna do a quick thank you again for our supporter, our sponsors for continuing to support us. Um, our presenting series sponsors, Dorsey and Whitney and Santec, our lead event sponsor, Larkin Hoffman, and our supporting event sponsors, Great River Energy, Minnesota Chamber of Commerce and Minnesota Power. Um, if there was someone here today that you weren't able to connect with, but would like to please send me an email and I can make that connection for you. Rachel will put my email in the chat for anyone who wants to send me an email. Um, I also hope you enjoyed today's event um, and are able to attend some of our other events this year. Um, so happy Friday and have a great weekend.